really good weekend of racing uh, i've got to say really enjoyed uh, all the action sunday and saturday of course we are on the back-to-back turnaround so we'll try and keep this brief try and get this video out as quickly as possible and it all started on thursday afternoon with the of course the announcement that Aleish Aspargros decided to retire from grand prix motorcycle racing at the end of the season he's announced at his home race and he's followed it up with a sprint win, <coughs> or a pole position and a sprint win on Saturday. The old fairy tale, not ending, but, you know, thing that we're going for here. Yeah, picked up a nice win on Saturday. Uh, was assisted by three riders. As we, This was a, um, a bit of a all-action sprint race is what we signed up for when we wanted sprint races. You know, you want the uh, all the drama that comes with a short, punchy sprint. So, three riders crashed out of the lead at some point in the race. First was Ralph Fernandez, who had a good weekend. We'll talk about him in a bit. The next one was Darren Binder, who looked like he was going back to doing his proper Darren Binder stuff, where you know what he's like. You know how we know how good he is. He looked like he maybe have been getting back to that, but did an unbinder thing in sort of crashing. And then Pecco on the last lap was home and clear comfortably just needed to keep it on two wheels and he failed to do so and then that meant that we had the hometown hero Aspargo and Mark coming in first and second Pedro Costa a nice third place while we're talking about that I mean let's talk about Peko this week because it was a tale of two Pecos these are the two Pecos we know right Dr. Jekyll just cannot shake Mr. Hyde as much as he wants to he's not going anywhere and with my team I think going on to that last lap was running fifth when Peko crashed it was a really big opportunity for him to bank a nice little buffer of points there put himself right back in the title hunt um, not that he's ever really out of it I want to say but he's just left this further off than he needs to be here after this weekend he was I think I thought for all money, I think even if maybe if Binder or Fernandez stayed on, he maybe doesn't win that race anyway. But he certainly, I thought he was the quickest guy. As the race went on, I thought he was gaining speed and we saw that that's what happened on the Sunday. So just left himself a huge buffer to Martin and Martin picking up points on him when he really shouldn't have done. And first time in ages, Martin's not showed up on a Saturday sprint. And Pecco's wasted it. When Sunday shows up, Pecco was faultless. Absolutely faultless. Like I said, it is a tale of two Peccos, Jekyll and Hyde, whatever you want to call it. Where does this come from with him? Like he was, there was some, this is where I think people don't think of Pecco as one of like, you know, if you have another guy with two world championships to his name at the age that Pecco's at and looking at building onto a third, people would be like, this guy's going to be one of the best we've seen in years. He's the one of the best we're going to see for a long time. But he just has this, self-destruct thing going on so i think that's why he doesn't really get mentioned in those circles you know people still think there are other riders on the grid that are better than him you know with reason you know i, I, I can't argue against it when you're looking at like you know quattararis and stuff obviously we're talking about mark but people are saying martin and stuff like that. guys without a world title people are saying they're better than him so uh, and this is why this is why martin had a good sunday while we're talking about him actually really good sunday after a disappointing saturday he did what peko can sometimes usually do and just be like i'm not on the pace on saturday but then he had a bit of pace on sunday obviously didn't have peko's pace but was still good and did enough when you lead the world championship by that much sometimes you've just got to be like i'm not as quick today he's gonna go far past me and this is it this is all i've got for him second it is and mark marquez so we spoke about him a bit earlier mark marquez has developed a party trick here <laughs> his party trick is just being nowhere in qualifying not making q2 and then just being quite like amazing on the sunday or even the saturday in the races i should say third on sunday it was second yes yeah, second on uh saturday he's a huge turnaround and if you've got him in fantasy like i brought him in this week guys you can't do better than that. I mean, if he's going to be doing this every week, you, you've got to have him. It's got a bit of a party trick there, like I said. It's like a, the old Binder trick from last season, isn't it? Where you just like, it was nowhere in qualifying, but then somewhere he'd pop up on the podium in the race. And it leaves him in good stead in the championship. I'm wondering if here, I mean, because we're seeing like over the top celebrations from Mark and it doesn't come across as like this fun thing for me. I'm like, it's a bit cringy for me a little bit. But look, if he's enjoying himself, I don't remember him being like this in the past. Not for podium maybe for when he wins a world championship it looks like he's winning a world championship every week when he comes second or third over the top but i mean people like it i guess i mean you tell me so how do you find it people in the crowd like obviously he's right in the crowd it's great at the time his home crowd and all that stuff like when i'm sitting at home watching him carry on i'm like oh my god like, just calm down a bit mate you come third there but look maybe you guys like it i don't know but he leaves himself just two points behind banyaya so he's right in the hunt but I'm wondering if these big celebrations and he's so happy, whether he's genuinely happy or if he's just putting it on, but if he's so happy because genuinely if Martin and Banyaya are on it that day, that's a win for him. You can't beat them on the 23 bike with them. If the 24 bike shows up and does that, 
the 23 bucks, you're not going to get it. When there is slightly like one or 2% off and he's right in the hunt like he was in Le Mans, then then maybe he can win on a day like that. But when it's like this, where them two are just firing and he's had to come from so far behind, this is a win for him, maybe. The 23 buck will not catch the 24 buck if Pecco's doing that, right? So maybe that's why the celebration is so, you know. But to see a guy with eight world titles celebrating like that to come third, I'm like, oh, come on, mate. Like, he has been utterly brilliant the last two races, I gotta say. And being that is my that is the true mark back and ready to fight. And uh, Magello this weekend, so whether he can do it there against the factory bikes, I don't know. But certainly when we get to a circuit that he is this is a mark circuit like Saxon Ring, I think he's a you'd have to have him down as a favourite. Who else uh, was good this weekend. I thought Pedro was fantastic. Obviously, another race crash. But for a rookie, I mean, we used to see it with Rossi and stuff like that when he was a rookie and all these sort of guys. Casey Stoner was one as well, where you just crash a bit, you know, sometimes in your first season. You have a good run, people get excited about you, and then there's little doubts creep in where, you know, you've crashed from good positions. Look, two in a row, but I think for him, the big thing is, are you on the pace every week? He's on a podium pace in every race. So whether you crash or not, I mean, it's not a big deal because you're not a genuine title contender this season. So, you know, if you're finished contending for sort of a top five in the championship and you're on podium pace every race, crack on, mate, crack on, have a few crashes, doesn't matter. Uh, another young guy did well, Ralph Fernandez. And this could be, a, like I said earlier in the season, I think this guy's doing enough. And he's absolutely done more than enough this weekend because he's he's been ahead of Oliveira all weekend. I don't know, the Joe Roberts thing, I can see that fizzing out a little bit and we'll get to that later on. For me, I think Oliveira's doing enough as well. I think this team should stick. As much as they may want an American in there, I'd be sticking here if I was them. And I think, like I said, even before this standout performance from Ralph Fernandez, I think I think he's been doing enough. I think Oliveira's been doing enough. I mean, like this weekend, they both finished ahead of Vinales, who, for God's sake, Vinales is just, every time you think he's on, he's just one of these riders that's just going to do this, where he has like a, he's, he's the worst Aprilia this weekend. So, but yeah, Ralph Fernandez, awesome. Uh, unlucky to crash out of the lead. Binder and Pecco maybe could have pulled that in at some point, but he was he, he, he had a bit decent gap. Sixth, he came on Sunday, falling away just at the end behind uh, Digi. But you know what? You're taking that every day if you hear him. He's, he's having a good, I think he's having a good season. He had a really good weekend. Now, there's three three riders I want to talk about uh, in a negative sense. Uh, and they are Frankie Morbidelli, Jack Miller, and Anaya Bastianini. Now, I've been pumping Anaya's tires up all season because I think, I still, look, still do. I think it'll be a good lead factory rider for somebody. But it's looking increasingly likely that won't be Ducati. As much as I wanted to see him do well and hold on to that seat, I was always under the thing that he can run around in fourth, fifth, third, fourth, fifth, right? And then some weeks he's going to turn up and you're not going to be able to touch him. Like he's just going to do that thing that he does where late in races, he's so quick and he catches. And we saw a glimpse of it in Le Mans, but he he had his issues, so he wasn't able to catch up in the end, but he had the pace to. And then here this weekend, he's just had a nightmare. And with the Ducati decision absolutely imminent, they would have to delay their decision to later in the year if they want to give Anaya the best chance to get the ride. Because if you're going to call it after Mugello, which they always say that they're going to do, they might wait another race or two. But if they're going to call it sometime after Mugello, there's no way at this point you could probably take him, I'd say. I mean, even in saying that, he's still fourth in the World Championship. He's 10 points behind Mark. It's not 12 points behind Pecco. It's not massive. It's not massive. And a good result in Mugello could bring him right back up with them too. But when you see the pace of the other two and then like the big, like what was, like a, just an absolute implosion this weekend from Bastianini. You know, you start to wonder where where it's going to come from. As much as I do think, I think 100% think it's going to be one of those things that later in the season, it will be announced that, you know, one of the other two gets the ride. Ducati might want to move him to a lower team, which he might take, or he'll get the offer from Aprilia, which people expect, and he might have signed for them. And you watch him go and win two or three races then. Like, I can 100% see it happening. But look, he had to get it done a bit earlier in the season, unfortunately. Uh, And then with Frankie, um, weird situation here where he's only on 15 points, but his pace is good. I think the last two to three races, he looks to have found something pace-wise, but he's got to stay on the bike. It's getting a bit silly. Found himself in a decent spot when he crashed this weekend from memory. He was was certainly not the slowest Ducati. You know, for him to be this far behind in the championship to a lot of the other Ducatis, like I think the next one up the road, Marquez on 43. And Bear's on 42 points. And he's on 15. He's making a bit of a meal of it. But the, like I said, the pace is there. Like, 
slowest, the worst Ducati in terms of championship position, but I don't think worse on terms of pace. There may be weekends where he might turn out to be the, the slowest of the A. Most weekends, there's at least one of them behind him. And this weekend, it looked like there was more than one that was slower than him. So, you know, he just needs to turn that into results at some point. I mean, look, the pace is enough to encourage, I think, teams and Ducati to think, we'll keep him in the family somewhere. Because we know where good he is when he does get it right. But maybe just work on, if he can work on getting that pace together with a bit of consistency in terms of finishing we might have something but it's just it just it's annoying at the moment watching him go down every week and the other one is Miller because another crash like it's just like what there's another one he's only on 27 points like Augusto Fernandez on 13 I know that's not good either but the next one up the road is Binder on 75 and Acosta on 83 but you've got to finish races at some point it's like with Jack I think he Jack will always be in a like an attractive prospect for some teams, even in a factory sense, like we've seen the links with Honda now, because he's a good character, brings good energy, obviously has a bit of an eye in sort of development, can give good feedback, because what he's done with KTM in his first season last year, you know, they went from nothing to, you know, I'm not saying it's all him, but certainly is a help, you know, for a team to have a guy like that around. And I think maybe Honda is looking at that, but at some point you've got to think, could Honda look at a guy that's really crash prone and go, we have a really hard bike to ride, people crash on it all the time. Is he going to be the best person to sort of not bring a to the front but even just give us the feedback we need finishing races all the time and that i think will sort of turn a few teams off you know if he's a crash prone guy you can be as quick as you want if you're not going to finish races teams aren't going to be as susceptible to it so i can see a step back to gas cas for him at this stage but we'll see right before we wrap up moto gp now we have to talk the all japan cup another big win for fabio in the all japan cup 10th on the road this week really good top 10 finish for him that's a first place in the all japan cup another 10 pointer he's running away with this even after he's in his uh crash in le mans ninth on the road of course ninth on the road sorry Inside the top 10, not just on the edge of it, inside the top 10. Uh, next next one down the road, Taka Nakagami, best of the Hondas, come at the moment, as we like to say with Taka. Mir, then Zarco, Marini, Stefan Bradle finishing ahead of Rins. Not sure what happened to Rins this weekend. I saw him get turf wide at the first corner, but I don't know what happened after that, if he had any more kinds of incidents, because he's finished over a minute down on the leader. So it leaves us first in the All Japan Cup. Fabio Quattraro goes to 43 points. Juan Mir holds on to second place on 24 points. Then it's tied for third. Taka and Zarco both on 21 points. Taka's having a season, man, I'm telling you. In fifth, Alex Rins. In sixth, Luca Marini. And then Bradle picked up points this weekend. Goes to three points. Uh, he's seventh. And we're still waiting. I think we were supposed to have maybe Cal by this point to mix it in there, but not yet. We'll get him eventually. Uh, and that's how the All Japan Cup looks after... Another week. Fabio's the man. Fabio is the man. On to Moto2, and this had everything. A bit of drama here in Moto2. Ayagura's won a sensational race, sensational performance from him to come back and pass Garcia. Late stage is really good on the time management, I guess. It's one of those circuits that that was going to be a key part um, with the low grip and all that stuff. Uh, but Garcia did what he had to do, doing the job. That's what we like to see from our title, well, my championship leaders, not just title contenders. Uh, Jake Dixon, nice uh, little return to form from him in third had a good race. And then got to mention Alcoba and Senna Aegis, fourth and fifth. Aussies abroad, here we go. Senna Aegis starting to uh, show a bit. That's what we want to see. The kid's got a bit about him. Uh, and Jeremy Alcoba came from absolutely nowhere. I don't know where he qualified, near the back. Uh, but all came about because we had a lot of like DNF from further up the field. Uh, is it Danny Munoz who was filling? Had a good weekend, but... Didn't finish. Vietti, Canet, both not finishing as well. I mean, we had um, Ramirez down and disqualified. Must have missed that. And then Somket Chantra. Well, was involved in the not. He didn't finish the first lap. Firm in the Vermin, Aldeguer. This race was riddled with my least favorite thing to do with any form of racing. Track limits warnings. With track limits warnings, we got long lap penalties. Put grass there. As we know, that's what we want. We want grass. Uh, not long lap penalties for track limit warnings, okay? Um, but anyway, that's by the by. Fermi and Aldeguer clocked up too many track limits warnings, copped a pen, and then approaching the long lap penalty, he looked a bit out of shape, and I was like, oh, he's going to struggle to pull this. I, my initial instinct was he would just pull it up, uh, sit it up, sorry, run it wide, and just cop the fact he was going to have to do another one for missing the long lap loop, running wide on it kind of thing, getting outside of the lines. That's not what happened. He tried to pull it up, lean it in, tuck the front, and away he went down the road, and that was him done for the day. I mean, there'll be, there'll be the inevitable talk now, like have Ducati jumped the gun on him. I still think he's destined for MotoGP anyway, so it's not a big deal. But his championship aspirations are in the bin a little bit. He sits a good 46 points off the pace, if my maths are correct there. Garcia, like I said, just doing his thing doing his thing, doing his thing. It's hard to see him getting beat from here unless Agora really starts 
coming for him. Joe Roberts, I think that this, he's had a really good start of the season, but I think this is more where he is, you know, talent-wise and where he's... Not that I think he's got... Like, he came like eight this weekend. I think he's still just off the podium kind of at his best. And I think championship-wise, I can see him finishing fourth, fifth. Hopefully, you know, for his sake, he proves me wrong because I do like Joe Roberts. It's just I don't have him up there with the elite of this group at the moment in Moto2. But yeah, back to Furman. You wonder if it's maybe a year too soon because you could always see, like, I know he finished the season really well last season. The four wins on the bounce or whatever it was. There's maybe a small factor in that that is like Pedro's already won the championship, so it was just like, meh. And he hadn't been amazing the season, the whole rest of the season before that. Like, he was good, but he wasn't like setting the world alight, was he? So, like, he was good, he was strong, but he wasn't uh, like elite, elite, like Pedro was doing. Like, he was on the pace this weekend, he was leading, so it's, you could maybe argue that he should have won that race. I don't know if late in the race, Agora would have got him anyway, but yeah, just these little things that, like I said, I think he's going to MotoGP anyway. It's just whether it was next year or the one after it just might be that it could have been a year early you know we could end up with a Ralph Fernandez situation where if teams are patient with him he might be able to build something like and get start to get onto the pace now like Ralph Fernandez is doing but you can get dropped early you can get dropped early if they don't think you're up to scratch straight away you know it could be you uh shafted you know so to speak. Moto 2 was fun this week. It was really fun. When you see things like that, the drama, you don't want to see guys, you know, crashing and stuff like that. But it does make the drama great. You know, when you the guy who's like your favourite to win the world championship behind at the moment, leading the race, crashes during a long lap penalty. I mean, it's just good scripting, really. Good scripting. Uh, in Moto 3, not much to say other than it was an Alonso masterclass. I'll just talk mainly about the end of the race here because it got to a point where you've got this group you have got this group, Alonso at the front, and he just pushes, you know, late in the race, last couple of laps, just so that it stretches them enough that no one can actually make a move on the guy in front. It just dragged them out and opened the gaps up between them just a little bit. They're all sort of two, three tenths apart, so there's no lunges that can happen. No one can attack him. He just stretched them a little bit. Brilliant, brilliant by this kid. Here. He's got it all. He's got it all, Alonso. Uh, Rueda was good. Rueda was good to snatch third from Via. Um, Ortola was good. Good to see him challenging back right at the pointy end again. I know he's always in and around the league group, but right at the business end of the race. Good results. Lanetta was good. Ralston, another top 10 for the rookie. And not much else to mention there with Moto3. It was what it was. It was a David Alonso day. He was brilliant. Um, and it leaves him 14 points clear now because the Olgado wasn't able to quite mix it with them at the very front and he finished about six, I think. So I don't think the likes of Vaira or Ortola are necessarily completely out of it. And when I say that, I mean... Can they catch Olgado maybe? Because I can't see Alonso stopping. Yeah, you know, I feel like he's gonna win like every second or third race at least. You know, he just always, always is there and he has the knack that some of the others don't have. He can put it in the right spot on the last lap or two to just ensure that he has the best chance of winning. And sometimes like this weekend, he's just too quick. So yeah, that's it for this weekend. We'll see you after Magello. Can't wait for Magello. It's going to be great. But yeah, looking forward to Magello. We'll see you after that one. Enjoy your weekend, guys. It's going to be a good one. See you on the next one.